what I'd like to do in this episode is bring together three or maybe four concepts that we've already looked at and just bring them together in a rough kind of a way almost like putting four objects on a table just to see what they look like so maybe <clears throat> maybe this will prove to be a good idea maybe it'll get us somewhere and maybe not but we'll try anyway just to see so the first concept though that's not really the right word is the concept of the universe as being enigmatic so Umberto Eco said that the universe is like a harmless enigma that can actually turn not so harmless at all if we insist on trying to solve it or work it out or if we insist on tangling with it this isn't of course to be taken as any sort of literal statement of fact if I say the universe is an enigma that's not really a statement of fact if it's an enigma I can't say anything about it so if I say that it's an enigma I'm already saying something about it so I'm already wrapping my head around it and then I can get the feeling that I've put it in a kind of a slot so yep yeah. yep yeah, the universe is an enigma sure and then move on to something else whatever that might be but I've kind of boxed it put it in a box so we'll take that statement just as a as a mark as a kind of marker the universe is an, an enigma just to kind of you know give us that kind of rough feel rough feel for for what it means for that without falling into the trap that we're actually saying anything really saying anything about the universe but it can be useful within in, in a provisional kind of a way so the, uh, the next thing, the next concept is the concept of aggression and also the idea that we are inescapably aggressive just as long as we're identified with the thinking mind, just as long as we're using the thinking mind to tell us who we are and what the world is, then we are inescapably aggressive because the thinking mind is by its very nature, pure aggression. It's pure aggression because it's trying to make sense of, of, of stuff. It's trying to say something about it. The whole time we're thinking, we're trying to make sense of the world. We're trying to say something about it which actually really means something, rather than just being something that we're saying in a kind of arbitrary way. So, straight away we can see that thinking operates by aggression. Thinking is aggression, but also it operates in such a way that it can't bear enigmas. It has to try and explain the enigma. So we've got the two things there. We've got the thinking and we've got the enigma. So when we put them together on the table, they don't get on. Or the thinking doesn't get on with the enigma. The two dogs I'd always fight. So the third concept would be, and again, it's not at all a concept, so I don't know why I keep calling it a concept. The third concept is, that when we practice 
mindfulness or when we are in a meditative state we see that everything happens by itself we see that we don't have to be there making decisions for every little thing you don't have to tell ourselves to breathe you don't have to tell ourselves to pay attention to the breathing we don't have to tell ourselves to come back to the breathing when we get distracted by thoughts and if we don't have to tell ourselves to do all these things that means that all these things just happen they happen of their own accord not because they have been instructed to happen that way and then the fourth concept which isn't really which isn't really it's kind of cheating because it isn't really different from the third concept is the I suppose you could call it a principle the principle of anatta or selflessness which is the 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 buddhist word kind of basically meaning doesn't matter where you look you'll find no self and that's a pretty central if not the central part of the buddhist teachings but we don't generally go into that too much we kind of think about other things or talk about other things but that inherently selfless nature of phenomena i think it's fair enough to say that's something we shy away from and other words too such as um the word emptiness all phenomena are said to be empty in buddhism and we can take that as meaning all things are empty of a self and that doesn't mean that they're hollow or that they're somehow lacking in something or that there's nothing really there in the sense that it's all just an illusion or a hallucination it means that there's no self in it which is upsetting because we we you really do want for there to be a self in it you kind of think well unless there's a self there what the hell's it all for what's the point of it because the self is kind of self-centered that way it thinks everything is for its benefit and that if it isn't there to enjoy or to appreciate or commentate on the world and what's the point of it but this is of course purely um just a purely selfish way a bizarrely and absurdly selfish way to look at things of course the world or the universe isn't there for the benefit of the self and if we thought about this a bit we we would realize it very well because suppose we come across an unusually selfish person like a properly real selfish and i don't mean that in a perjurative sense i just mean it someone who's incredibly um incredibly locked into themselves and can only see things in terms of their selves so they're very self-absorbed and we can all be like that at times and <clears throat> if we consider the possibility that when we are in that position of being totally totally self-absorbed to totally engrossed in looking at things from our own point of view then we know that such a person thinks they're the center of the universe and we know that such a person thinks that stuff's only worth something if it means something to them so if it doesn't actually benefit them what's the point in it and so we know that that is a laughable kind of a way to look at things because we know that everything in the world isn't there just for 
the benefit of whatever selfish person might think it is. We, we are pretty clear on that. And in the same way, reality or the universe or the world is not there for the benefit of any self. Which is another way of saying it's not there to be exploited or mined for some benefit. And that's interesting because what we do, what we, and the only thing we do generally in life is go around for looking for M advantages, looking for a way to exploit. How can I exploit this? How can I exploit this situation? What kind of angle can I take here? Can I find here, just like a businessman, looking for an angle, looking for a way to make a profit. So, both collectively and individually, we're exploiters. It's like exploit, exploit relationships too. We are exploiting, we're exploiting the other person. And even when we think we're in love or we think we're having a very um, altruistic relationship with someone. As Anthony DeMello says, when we look into it, in most cases, we're exploiting. So if I'm in love with someone, I'm kind of exploiting that for the good feeling that it gives me. And Anthony Romero says, well, if you want to test that one out, imagine that you're in love or if you are in love and your um, partner suddenly has the possibility of becoming much happier by walking off with someone else. Would you feel happy for them for this? I think, Great, because if you're caring about them and not yourself, you would, of course. But as we know from them, um, the chemistry of relationships that isn't going to go down well with anybody of course it isn't it's no one's going to be behaving in that kind of altruistic way so reality is this thing which does not exist for the self and which it is meaningless for the self to imagine that it can exploit and yet here we are exploiting away or trying to exploit to the best of our abilities and people who are great at exploiting are called winners and people who aren't very good at exploiting are called losers and we celebrate winners and we look down on the losers and yet ultimately it's all a nonsense because reality can not be exploited because it has no relationship with the self it doesn't exist for the self and when the self tries to exploit the world or reality. It does this by translating reality into its own illusory terms. So it does it by transforming the world into an illusion. And so there's no real benefit to come out of that at the end of the day because you can't milk any benefit out of an illusion. You might seem to for a while and get excited about it, but sooner or later it'll turn to it'll turn to dust. You realise that what you've caught isn't anything. And you realise what you've got in your hand is just a handful of dust. And so there's no great happiness to come out of that. So that's the four <clears throat> that's the four things we're gonna put on the table. Um, the universe as an enigma, the concept of aggression, and the fact that we were inescapably aggressive, which is the same thing as saying inescapably exploitative. And the concept that when we're in a meditative state, we can see that we don't need to control that everything happens by itself. in some kind of mysterious way. 
but also in a very nice way. It's nice to see that everything is happening by itself. It runs a lot better that way than when we think we have to interfere. And then the fourth one is the principle of selflessness or the principle that reality is devoid of any self or there's no selves in it. So we can say that those four concepts kind of go together in a way, they, they, they all kind of bounce off each other. So coming back to the universe as an enigma, that's the same thing as saying that the universe cannot be exploited. So instead of exploit, we can just say it can't, we can't make sense of it in any way. We can't make it intelligible to us. We can't say anything at all about it or establish that kind of relationship between us and it such that we kind of can, can actually make comments about it or define it. And ultimately this, as I was saying in the previous episode, this attempt to do what cannot be done, this attempt to solve the enigma, creates all of our neurotic misery. And we insist on thinking that we can free ourselves from this neurotic misery by being all clever and knowledgeable. And if you don't believe that, just try hanging out in the mental health industries. Most of the um, people that work in it have this air of being clever and knowledgeable. And to some extent, it's kind of necessary because we won't be taken seriously and it's part of the job to look that way. It's kind of expected, it's the role. So maybe we can't blame people too much for it. But where, whereas being clever and knowledgeable is can, can be pretty good in some areas, it's, it's, it's not helpful here, not in, in, in mental health. So the, the helpful thing with neurotic suffering, which is where we're locked into trying to solve the enigma, is of course to stop trying to solve the enigma. And learning to get better at allowing the enigma to be an enigma, which it does very well. It, it does that superlatively well and there's no problems. So if we can only just be okay with it doing what it does superlatively well, then there will be no problems. But then this brings us to the kind of obstacle we have in doing this, because suppose I go along with that. And maybe I will do because it gets very non-stop neurotic suffering. It certainly will make you want to try anything. So maybe you try the, all the usual things and they don't really get you very far. Or maybe they do, I don't know, but if they do, then we can forget about that person. We can forget about the person who seems to have got rid of his neurotic suffering, by whatever means. But if you haven't been able to get rid of it, you, you will be open to the idea of trying something different, which might be being okay with the enigma. And so the, the great obstacle that arises then is that when we are okay with the enigma, and that means that we're okay about not trying to solve it or make sense of it, and that also means being okay about not exploiting it for our benefit. So I'm no longer trying to exploit it. My relationship with the world is more of an artist who is interested in the world 
for its own sake, for what it is in itself, rather than, than for what he or she can get out of it. But when I do that, something remarkable happens, because it turns out that by aggressing the enigma, trying to make sense of it, trying to exploit it, that's how I create my concrete sense of myself. That's the only way I can create a concrete sense of identity. So when I stop aggressing, if I, like I said earlier, that we can't stop aggressing, that the conditioned self can't stop aggressing. And that's not wholly true because we can, but when we do, we stop being the, the concrete self, we stop being the conditioned identity. So that I discover when I stop trying to solve the enigma, make sense of the enigma, put it in a box somehow, get something out of it. I discover that this sense of self that I have is disappearing. And that doesn't seem very beneficial for me. It doesn't seem very beneficial for the sense of self anyway. And it was the sense of self, to a large extent, that had got involved in this idea of trying to cure the neurosis or cure the neurotic suffering by getting on friendly terms with the enigma. But if it turns out that curing the neurotic suffering by getting on, by not aggressing the enigma means that there is no more viable sense of self that I can go around taking seriously, then that doesn't make sense from the perspective of doing it for the sake of benefiting the sense of self. So at that point, I'm very likely to suddenly start taking a dim view of the whole, of the whole business. So there is a great resistance to not ag aggressing the, the enigma. But on the other hand, the, the redeeming factor here is that who we are, essentially, is not this knot of tension, as Alan Watts calls it, that is the conditioned self this kind of sense of being outside of life or separate to life and controlling from the outside rather than being part of it. And that essential part of us appreciates the peacefulness that comes, the sense of harmoniousness that comes when we're no longer fighting. So there's two things here. There's the part of us that's identified with the rational ego, which is going to fight even harder when it sees what's going on. And there is that other thing, which is, which is the unconditioned part of ourselves, which is the part of ourselves which isn't wholly identified with the rational ego or concrete identity. And that part of ourselves is going to be delighted and appreciate, as I just said, the marvellous feeling of harmony and peacefulness. But there are these two elements, so that means the conflict is still ongoing particularly as the fighting part of ourselves will fight even harder once it starts to sense what's really going down here. Okay, thanks for watching.